I might actually get us started now so we can hear from our incredible um, kai kōrero. So no mai haere mai ki te kōrero i tēnei wā. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome to our Sunday kōrero. Um, and you'll see on our screen, if you're not here for nurturing wairua, anchoring activism in place, you may be in the wrong place, but I suspect that you're all exactly where you're meant to be. So I might just ask... Um, our tech support crew to to move over to our next slide and and get us started. I imagine some of you have already been to our sessions, but our ten days together is is really important to be able to know how we are in right relationship with each other. So our community code for all of these corridors is that we are curious, open, and respectful. We make generous assumptions. We treat this room with a degree of confidentiality so we can share what needs to be shared. One person, one mic. We speak from our own experience. We accept that no one knows everything, but together we know a lot. We make space, we take space. We understand that we can't be articulate all the time. And we try not to take ourselves a little bit too seriously, which I think as activists we, we do from time to time. So we'll try to, to keep it a little bit real as we go. And on to our next one. Awesome, fantastic. So a little bit of housekeeping before we start. And you may have been to some of these sessions before already, but um, important to know that as you are doing right now, you can keep interacting in the chat. You can also ask questions in the Q&A box as well. Um, we will. We also have a moderator on hand to be able to facilitate discussions. So <clears throat> please do keep this going. We might not always have the time to be able to respond to everything that's going on in the chat box, but it's really important that we can be interacting, particularly at this time. And I think a lot of us have been quite isolated. So any other vocado? I think those are the main housekeeping things to note. Um, yeah. So I'm going to just start us off with a karakia to enter us into our kōrero, if that feels appropriate. So just want to acknowledge where you may be joining us from, who you are bringing with us in this kōrero, who you might have running around in your home, um, people who you might have in your place or your whānau who might be recovering or coming down with COVID and all the people that you're connected to at this time. So thank you for deciding to share space with us today on this Sunday afternoon. Tu koe te wairua kia riri, ki ngā tau matahe ārahi, ia tātou mahi me tā tātou whai, ngā tika ngā rātou mā, kia mau, kia ita, kia kore ai ngaro, kia pupuri, kia whakamaua, kia tīna, tīna, haumie, huie, tai ki e. Hau pai. So my job here is Ringa Hapai. My job here is facilitator. Um, he uri tine no ngati raukawa, uh, ko Kesi Hartan tok tok wengwa. But my job here is to be able to provide space to, for our incredible speakers, Lewis Williams and Emilani, to be able to share some kōrero with you here today. Now we had a bit of a um, a bit of a brainstorm, a bit of discussion before today, and we started to be able to sow some seeds of what we might be able to share share today. So I will be prompting us as we move through. Um, we have a few different topics we'd like to call it all about, but also please do share into the into the question box, and I will I will draw out some of the questions that we might be able to share as well. Should we have time? The main thing here is just being able to be together across oceans, actually, and and share in this quite important call it all. So instead of um, not doing our speakers justice and going through a bio, I think it's really important that all Indigenous ca people can speak for themselves and introduce themselves. And so I'm going to hand over and first start, who are you? Who are you? Nōhia koe, where are you from? Maybe a bit about what brought you here to this day, to this point. And I'm going to turn over to Lewis to, to get us started. Kia ora, Lewis. Yeah, um, kia ora tātou, um, nā mihi mahana ki a koto katoa, uh, nō nā iwi o ōna te rangi, ko te rāna, wera, uh, hamane, me ham, hamane o ka tipuna, um, ki te taha toko mama, ko nā te rangi te iwi, uh, ko Tauranga Moana, te rohi, 
ko mawa o te maunga, ko rua hini puhi te tangata. Um, ko rua is William Zaha. I, um, I'm actually talking from the um, traditional territory of Deshkan Zibi here in Kanata. So um, I'm speaking today from the uh, traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, and the Luna Lapani people. Um, so very warm greetings across Te Moana Nui Akiwa. It's really uh, just really warms my heart to be um, connecting up with my homeland and um, Pacific as well. So that's really great. Um, if uh, gosh, so I just you know one, I just told you that uh, my ancestry is um, from Ngāi Taronga Moana, but also um, Scotland. Germany and um, Wales, and so these are these are my ancestral lines. They're they're all part of me. I um, just very quickly. I grew up in Tawaki Makaurau. I grew up completely um, disconnected from my Ngāi roots. Um, I I believe uh, Turanga Waiwai. Um, it's been a quite a lifelong journey for me. I, I think it is for for many of us, and. Um, it's certainly been an important one in terms of my own activism and the um, the papa or the foundation um, from which I, I stand. Um, a couple of other things, I, and I guess other things will weave into the conversation, but I am um, actually um, trained as a social worker and community developer and in public health. So a lot of my um, so-called formal education was, has been very much within the Western systems. And um, it's, it's been through other means that I've really come into my Ngātadangitanga and um, that's been quite a journey for me over um, at least um, 20 years. So but that's, that's a few things in terms of um, who, I, who I am. Yeah, kia ora. Kia ora, Lewis. And Milani, no hia koe. Mai ka eina kaulana i kaua ki puupuu, makamaku puni nui o Hawaii i ka pāki pika a kau, a hiki loa mai i kia eina kaulana i nga ka Hawaii, o ia hoi o te whanganui ātara, ka eina ue noho nei i kia maulā, ki aloha nui a kākou, o wau no o Emelani Keys, no waimea Hawaii mai au, um, a kā ke noho nei wau ma keia eina o te whanganui ātara, a heleo mahalo keia i nga mana whenua, um, okay, yeah, I know. Uh, my name is Emelani Case. Um, I'm from a place called Waimea in Hawaii, um, but I'm currently living here in Te Whanganui Atara. Um, you know, I thought a little bit about how best to introduce myself, and I think how best to introduce myself is to introduce you to where I come from, um, because any conversation about activism in place or activism for place or motivated by place um, I think requires you to know a little bit about the places that have raised me and fed me. So I come from a place called Waimea, um, known for its wai, its wai, its water, um, that is mea, that it's um, a reddish color. Um, but very importantly, and I mentioned it in my greeting to all of you, Waimea is quite famous for its rain. Um, Hawaiians, we love to name everything. We name rains, we name winds, we name mountains, we name hills, we name rocks, clouds, everything. Um, but the rain in Waimea is called the Kipu'upu'u, and it's a rain that stings, it's a harsh rain. And one of our um, prominent chiefs, Kamehameha, would train warriors in Waimea, and he called them the Kipu'upu'u, and he named these warriors after the rain because it stings your skin, um, and it conditions you for battle. And I'm not at all saying that I am a warrior. <laughs> But what I am saying is that growing up in Waimea, I think, conditioned me for something. Um, any work that I do in my life is, I think, was I was made ready for by growing up there. Um, to be Indigenous means you're born into a kind of political reality, as the dear my dear friend Tina Ngata says in the beginning of her book, um, Kiamo, it means that you're born into a kind of reality that often comes with a sting a colonial sting, a kind of pain um, that you have to withstand, um, but you never want to get used to 
you never want to grow numb to, but you always feel it. And I think that kind of sting is what motivates all the work that I do at home and here. Um, so yeah, I think introducing myself is, is to introduce you to where I come from because it's everything that I am. Um, I might have some little letters behind my name and I might have some credentials, but first and foremost, I'm just a kupa o kaaina. I'm someone from Waimea, from land, um, from place. And that's what feeds everything, everything that I do. Um, and I think my greatest responsibility in life is to be an aloha aina. And that's something I can talk about a little bit later, but aloha means love. <laughs> Um, and aina is our place, is our word for land, but it also is more generally about any place and, and source of sustenance that feeds and nourishes. And so today's talk, I think I'll focus a lot on aloha aina, which is this fierce, protective, intimate kind of love for place that motivates um, not just the activism that I do, but that motivates a lot of the activism that so many of us do and are engaged in. Um, yeah, so I might, I might leave it there as an intro and I'm looking really looking forward to the conversation today. Thanks everyone for joining in. Mm. Kia ora and hey, Milani, you've talked a little bit about this already but we, when we started um, having a conversation about anchoring ourselves in place we talked about the importance of what um, what is beneath our feet knowing what is beneath our feet and my question to you both is um, what is your thought about how have you discovered knowing um, what's beneath your feet? What does it mean to know your own Turanga Wai Wai? What does it mean to know what's beneath your feet, perhaps elsewhere? Well, I think it's I I, I think it, I think it's everything. And um, you know, I, I think I think of Turanga Wai Wai. For me, like knowing what's beneath my feet, I think of it both in terms of the whenua, both in terms of the land, but I, but I also think of it's about knowing what's beneath my feet inside as well. Um, I'm someone I've actually, I've lived in many different places. And um, so in, in some ways I've had to create, recreate Turanga Wai Wai again and again. And again, in, in a sense, and I, and and for me, the the activism. If I if I think about when I was, I was not born in place. I was I, for me, I was born displaced, and that that has been a lifelong journey. And so, I remember that when I was wanting to get to know the Naitarangi part of myself. Um, Auntie Maria Nata, um, who was one of our queer in the Tauranga Moana and she was the she was the queer who opened the gates for me because I was just longing to be of place I was longing to be in place and one of the things that Auntie Maria said to me was well to know who you are and to know who Naitirangi are you have to know who Maua was our, our sacred manga and so for me um, it was, and I was, I was living in, uh, I was living in uh, Canada by that Turtle Island by that time, and it's been many, many years of of weaving back and forth. And at that time, I I spent a lot of time with uh, Korea and Koro, getting to know who Mawa was, is, and Mawa was a real um, rongo to me, and so I take Mawa wherever I am. But also where I am is I engage in practices that help me to be of place and create that papa for that, that foundation um, from which to um, which to, to be me and to, to do to do to do the work I do. So and it's all about relationships. Yeah. So that that's a little bit from there from me on that yeah it's it, just picking up on that it's it's definitely about relationships and for me I was taught at a very early age to grow relationships with place through story and I'm just looking behind me this is my cousin Pua um, who's my hula teacher 
she, I've been dancing hula with her and chanting and learning um, my entire life. Um, just the other week, we had a Zoom hula practice so I could get my body back into moving again and telling stories. But what hula taught me at a very early age, I started dancing hula before I went to school, was that everything has a story. Every single thing has a story. And so what's beneath my feet is literally Aina, it's Finwa, it's land, but it's story and it's history. Um, and I, wherever I am in the region, whether I'm home, whether I'm here, I feel like I'm always in search of story so that I can build a relationship with place that is beyond just what I can see. Um, you know that what what's beneath our feet, we started talking about that because when we met the other week, I had just come out of my PASI 101, my Pacific Studies 101 class, where the theme of the week is what's beneath our feet. And that phrase comes from a poem by a Hawaiian um, poet named Imai Kalani Kalahele, where he says, the source of my origins lie beneath my feet. And in my Pasi 101 class, which I think is really important, particularly for non-Maori Pacific students, I try to encourage them to really think about place and where we are. Um, drawing inspiration from the incredible Dr. Teresia Tewa, whose courses I'm now teaching at Victoria University of Wellington, she said that any love of the Pacific, any understanding of the Pacific, any grasping of the 20,000 islands out there must begin with where we are. So when I talk with my Pacific students about loving place and being in active protection of place, we start with where we are and I ask them, where are you? And we sit in the classroom and they look at me like that's the dumbest question ever. They're like, duh, yeah, we're in the classroom. We're at uni, we're on Kelburn Parade, we're on, you know, at the Kelburn campus. Um, and then I dig a little bit further and I tell them the story of when Alice Tipunga Somerville was teaching at Vic Uni, um, the incredible Alice Tipunga Somerville. If you haven't read her work, highly recommend everything she's written. But she tells a story about setting up her office at the Kelburn campus and an elder coming with her to the office and pointing to the street below her office and saying, that's Kumutoto. Kumutoto stream runs under this street. So when you're here, you need to remember that. And as she writes in one of her pieces called Culvert, she says that e there are still eels swimming in these big culverts, these big tunnels that the stream still runs through. And she says they still swim because nobody told them to stop being eels. And it's dark, but they still do what they're supposed to do. So we go on this examination of streams. We talk about streams in, in Te Whanganuiatara, all of the streams that are literally underneath the city we call Wellington. Um, and I don't know all of them, but I'm learning and I'm on a journey to learn the stories of them. And so I try to take the students on this learning journey with me so that by the end of the class, when I ask that question, where are you? It's not just taking Wellington and Kelburn for granted, but saying, actually, we're walking on water. We're walking on Kumutoto and I want them to know those stories. And I might not be able to teach them how to love a place, but I do, I do believe that growing relationships with place and growing connections with place that then feeds our activism for place starts with those stories. Starts with knowing the eels. Starts with knowing the fact that even though we can't see them, that they're there. And that those streams are still life-giving and they're still flowing and they were here before us. They're older than us. And again, I think this is really important for our Pacific students, especially. It's good for all students, yes. But I teach, the majority of my students are of Pacific heritage, not Maori. Some of them are mixed. But for them to find them their place in this country and to see why their activism matters here and in the region, we have to start with examining what's beneath our feet. Um, and that starts with stories. So yeah, just sorry. To, bridge off of what um, you were saying, Lewis, about relationships. I think relationships are deeply storied. I mean, it's the stories that then motivate us to keep acting. Um, no, I, I, can, uh, I can really connect to that, actually, in terms of um, the ground beneath your feet. So I've, I've actually been here in Desh Kanzibi, Rohi, for eight months now. So I'm, I'm like learning myself, right? And and I'm just thinking, one of the courses I teach is um, contemporary um, issues for Indigenous peoples in Canada. And I, I um, hope no um, affront to people here, but I feel at the moment like I'm in probably, in terms of what's been done to Papa Tuanuku, I must be in one of the most colonised places mm -hmm. in, in the world. I... Um, 
the and the what what I find so I'm I'm teaching both Indigenous and non-Indigenous students and Indigenous students who are disconnected from their place, and and the whole question is um, what's beneath your feet, you know? So, you know what what is the the cultural fabric? What what is what is the nature of this earth, this river? What's 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 beneath the colonial scape? And one of the things that we have here is, and in Canada, is a land acknowledgement, right? Mm. And so, so the, the land acknowledgement gets prattled off, and or rattled off. And and I'm in the process of saying, um, no, see if you can make the land acknowledgement your own, right? And and. And so that's all about like finding out what is beneath your feet, what's the ground beneath your feet, yeah. what, yeah, and and what what's the tikanga, what's happened here, you know, and it's it's not just yes, it's it's glaciers, but it, it's also yeah, yeah, you know, eons of people coming, migrations, um, mm. and that really that that being of place. So I, I think that's so mm. important. In a, in a time when many are so disconnected from Papa Tūnuku. And yeah. it's a really, to, to, to get people to make a land acknowledgement their own, from their own their own voice, um, I think is a, it, it's a really important thing. So, yeah, it's, um, and in that sense, you know, the, the river here, actually, Dashkanzibi, actually means um, deer antler. And um, here, there's the, the presence of Indigenous people visibly is actually quite small. So it's very different from home. It's very different from Aotearoa. And it really, in terms of that activism from place, it also takes a lot of building the relationships with the with the local and and that trust and the relationality with the with the Anishinaabe, the the Haudenosaunee, the lo the local indigenous people here. So it's 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 an interesting it's an interesting journey. It's it's a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's and one of my most in ter in terms of getting to know a place. So before I left home. I was doing a rongo Māori in Tauranga Moana. So, and so studying it and I was going with the Nahere and I was having a lovely time. And then it, when I came here as a way, as a practice of trying to connect to here, and of course I was on the Zoom with my car call, I started to um, do, so I started to undertake some very small practices of, of harvesting, right? As my way of getting to know the, the whenua here. And one of the things that when I, I just think about being of place and activism of place and, and reciprocity, one of my real aha moments came when um, I wanted to, and this is, relates to the Dash Kanzibi here, the river here, I wanted to harvest some um, willow, which is actually not an indigenous tree to here. And I realised actually that I could not because the Dash Kanzibi the, the, this water being, Nibi, uh, is so mistreated that from when she floods, that um, she interacts with all the storm water and the sewerage. Mm -hmm. And so, so I realized I could not harvest mm -hmm. the willow. And so for me, it was a real coming into relationship with the reality of not only the the power, mm. but also also the, the woundedness as, yeah. as the woundedness that is of place as well, you know, and that um, I'm I'm currently teaching and and being in, mm. you know, and um, and being with the students in mm. Re really interesting stuff when we think about both the healing capacities and the trauma and the wounds of place yeah. and activism and, and, and how we are with that. Mm. Yeah, um, re relationships 
with place are it's about the it's it's be, they're beautiful but they're painful at the same time and it's about loving loving place in and out of pain um which i think is a reality for indigenous people and me you know going back to the the stinging rain of waimea it, it's this kind of conditioning i think growing up as indigenous and having experienced constant displacement desecration being locked out of places that at one one day you're in home you're at home in and the next day you're labeled a trespasser that kind of gut wrenching pain that comes with being disconnected from your relationship with place I think that's yeah I just wanted to acknowledge what what you said about about pain and I saw someone in the in the chat said solastalgia I learned that word a few years ago and solastalgia is the experience of homesickness that you ex that you feel when you're still at home. And it's the kind of homesickness that is so painful because you you watch home transform. You watch the beaches become white for the visitor. You watch the, the forest become locked off because they don't want you accessing it to, to pick your plants or to gather resources mm. for your medicines. Or you, you watch a mountain become off limits because they want to build a tel telescope on its summit. It's that kind of pain that you can experience from anywhere in the world. Um, but it's the kind of watching of your home transform. Um, so yeah, relationships with pain, relationships with place come with experiences of pain. But I think what motivates my activism and what motivates the activism that so many of us do is the hope that generations from now, they won't have to experience that same kind of pain. What we do is we try to make what was ours home always. For the next generation when i think when i go back to what's beneath our feet i think what's beneath our feet is the future it's and and thinking about mm. water, thinking about water and the streams that i talked about earlier um and i can connect this back to hawaii last year our one of our aquifers on the island of oahu or our, our one of our fresh water sources was contaminated by the u.s military which is a major polluter in hawaii and current occupier of hawaii um, and I really started to think about aquifers and these collections of water beneath the surface. It can take decades for a single raindrop to filter through layers of earth to get to the aquifer. And when I really started to think about these precious water sources beneath our feet, that is water that was made ready for us generations ago, decades ago. The water in the aquifer is a reflection of the way people lived decades ago. And I am in fear of what that aquifer is going to look like dec decades from now based on the way we're living our lives. So what's beneath our feet, the future that is going to feed generations from now. And if anything, it's that kind of intimate knowing of place that is going to motivate us to do better, no matter where we are. I have to be obligated to being better at home and I have to be even better here on land that isn't, that isn't mine. Um, so I think what's beneath our feet, it's, it's our, all of our sources of sustenance for now and for the future. Um, and that's why developing those relationships with place as painful as they can be, is so necessary. Yeah. <laughs> Ross, do you have anything to say on this court at all? Carl? Sorry, say that again, Kirsty. What did you say? I was say? just saying, did you have anything to respond? I think there's a lot. You well, there's, there's a, a lot of literal ground, but is there yeah. anything that's jumping out to you right now? Yeah, no, there's um. Actually, what does jump out to me? So okay, so there's, and I'm I'm thinking of um. There's a there's a uh, Maori scholar. Uh, he's two forty tall. And um, Hauti Hakopa, I think, he talks about that to really know who you are, right? You, you, it's one thing to look at a place on a map, right? Mm -hmm. But to really know, and he's talking about going back to your ancestral lands, right? And he's saying to really know who you are, you have to go and stand in that place mm -hmm. and, to, and, to, and to know that place. And I'm um, I'm actually thinking about because like, I think I think we've had quite different journeys in term in terms of finding the ground beneath our feet and the land and the land beneath our feet in terms of feeding our activism. 
But I was actually just, so I was thinking about, because I, I think to know who I was in terms of my activism, right, I, need, I had to go back to Toro Moana and, and, to, and to both from someone who is of, um, I think, quite complex dual lineage, right, right, both colonised and coloniser lineage, Mm -hmm. And and had that someone who had this longing for place to be fed by a place mm -hmm. that I that I actually had to, but who hadn't lived in whose ancestors had not lived, the fires had almost gone cold. Mato had almost gone that cold. And I went back, right, and rekindled those those fires. But but I also had to learn about the traumas that had happened to my own people, right? in the generations that had passed, right? Because I had been, you know, growing up in Tamaki Makaurau. But I'm thinking about how the land and the future is beneath our feet. Um, I actually went back to, I took my mother there where a battle happened in the Tauranga Moana called the Battle of Teranga. And it was the, it was the battle that then the land confiscations followed. And then the disruption, the, the disruption of the Whakapapa followed that because, because people were displaced from the land. Mm. My great grandfather left shortly after that. Going back to Teranga, I, I learned that after that battle, right, that the, that the bodies of warriors lay there for many, many years. And I, I took my mother back to that place because she didn't know that place. And in that place, was both the grief of the place, right? But also, also um, the wonderful, the healing of that place as well, right? And, uh, and the, the whenua can give you dreams. And the, the whenua gave my mother a dream that night that was, that was really, really healing. And so there's something that's coming to me about um, one of the things I, I, I practice in terms of the, my two forms of spirituality, right, as my Ngāi Tanga, but it's also order, also my Theravadan Buddhism. Mm. And there's something about having the equanimity, right, the, the equanimity where one, as an activist, one's being is able to hold, right, but is able to hold all those experiences, all the experiences that place is is giving one, right? And 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 all the ex, or all the experiences, whatever the activism that one is involved, to be in, to be able to really meet that in a in a in a, in a good way, yeah. And so so I'm. Um, and in a in a in a, a full way and in a, in a, a solid way, um, yeah. So that, they're just a, a few reflections um, on the whole thing about the the whenua and mm. a, a tūranga wai wai. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. You both asked me to prompt you to talk a bit about positionality. <laughs> um, yeah, what do you think about that? How does that connect with activism, land, place? Hmm. I think positionality is critical. And I think that I've become more conscious of it since moving here. Um, I, anyone who's heard me speak before will know that I often talk about being an indigenous woman living on land. I'm not indigenous too. And that comes with certain responsibilities and obligations. Um, but I've never really, I, I wouldn't have had to ask those kinds of questions if I never came here to Aotearoa. So I'm really thankful for the way that this being here and being on this land has nourished me in so many ways and, and actually pushed me to become more critical of my positionality. Um, positionality is really just about thinking very critically about your positioning. Who are you? Who am I in relation to this place, in relation to the Fenua, in relation to Mana Fenua, in relation to um, people here in relation to history, in relation to story. Um, who am I in my multiple intersecting identities in this place? Um, you know, my Samoan and Tongan friends who talk about the Va, I think the Va is quite helpful in thinking about the space between as a, you know, the, 
there's always a va, there's always a space between me and other things and other people. And it's about nurturing that space and really thinking critically about the ruptures and the disconnects so that we can nurture relationships and grow healthier relationships. So positionality is key. And, and to bring it you know, to the, the theme of Te Tiriti based futures and anti-racism, being here as a Pacific person who's not of the dominant Pacific populations in Aotearoa, it raises a lot of questions for people. Who are you? What are you doing here? Why are you here? Um, and I, I maintain that I'm here because when people know how much I love home, <laughs> how I am home, how home is me, they always ask, Emelani, why are you so far away from home? And I apologize, I might get a little emotional because it's been a while since I've been home. So I'm incredibly homesick. But I'm here because I truly do believe in a larger regional identity. And I believe mm. in activism that is dedicated to the region. I believe in my Pacific links. I believe in whakapapa connections and responsibilities. And I know that coming here to this country has helped me to grow as an activist and extend my love of place that was nurtured in Waimea to every single place that I'm in. But with that love, again, I have to always be conscious of my positionality and who I am and who I am not, very importantly. I'm not indigenous to here. I'll never pretend to be, which means I am very happy to always take the back seat or grab the tea towel. <laughs> in any <laughs> You know, um, it means that I need to honor Te Tiriti, not because some document tells me to, but because I have fuck up up connections to the people who are indigenous here and our genealogical obligations predate the establishment of this settler colony, predate even the signing of that treaty. My obligations to my Tangata Whenua kin come from an understanding that we were all related. And, that, and that's, just part of what positionality is. So when I walk into classrooms with, with mostly Pacific students, we talk about that. What does it mean to honor Te Tiriti? What does it mean to honor your links with Tangata Whenua? How can we enact that? How can we do that? It's all about positionality and asking those really critical, sometimes sticky, icky questions about who we are, how we came to be here and what our being here means. Ooh. Well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm suddenly, while you were talking, Imilani, I was reminded um, that something one of my queers said to me, uh, Naro Mata, Auntie Naro Mata Kevil. She said, I'm always careful where I put my feet when I'm not in the Tauranga Moana, right? <laughs> so when she's, you know, out, else, elsewhere. And I have a feeling that she was saying that that was sort of intended for me, right? And that, that was a time when I, I was actually, you know, coming and going from home and, and to and to Canada. And so when I when I think of um, positionality, it yeah, it's incredibly critical. And I, when I think of positionality, just so the, the language here, I mean here there are many, many treaties, right? And um, you know, here the foundational one was a two-row wampum. But when I think about, um, I think about it in terms of decolonization and indigenous resurgence, right? And how how can the, the voice and the knowledge of Papa Tunuku reemerge, right? And it fully and 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 to me, I I work and I like to kind of one, it's being aware of my own positionality, right? And that's um, you know th that kind of goes on all the time and I see you know on a personal level it's my responsibility to use my position my pie here right to to actually bring in the traditional knowledge holders right who are at the margins of the academy at the margins of local government etc when I'm working with my students I think it's incredibly important that everyone can see themselves in the picture. So mm -hmm. just the other, the other um, day, so I, we were working with, um, we've been working for two or three weeks with the whole, the issue of murdered and missing um, Indigenous women and girls and two-spirited gender diverse people. And of course, that's very, it's intimately connected to the way that Papa Tunuku is treated to the fossil fuel um, industry, 
right, to environmental degradation. It, all these issues have, are really interconnected. Mm. And also in my class, I have, um, you know, there's um, women, young women and men who are also racialized, right? So they, they, they're um, recent immigrants. I have people who, um, students who may not be indigenous to here, but they could, they're too spirited, right? And so gender, so, and so, you know, the way that I also try and work with this in terms of, um, you know, thinking about aki and or the Papatunuku and creation is that I, I also try and draw some parallels in terms of, say, if we take um, thinking about decolonization and indigenous resurgence. So here in Canada, two-spirited people, right, had special had special roles, responsibilities, and obligations within the, within their societies, right. And um, I and I have um, found that even as Takatapu myself, I have found and you know and we know how colonised, mm -hmm. right? Our um, you know our our identities have also become right. And so so I try and I also try and say so can you see you know the the benefits of decolonisation, right? Not not only in terms of Papatuanuku, right, and indigenous resurgence and indigenous rights, but how you also think of yourselves as part of creation, right? Instead instead of these just as part of the interconnected fucker papa, right? So I so I I so I try I find it incredibly important to try and work with these different positionalities. Mm -hmm in ways where people can see that everyone can see themselves as, as part of that yeah. picture mm -hmm. um, and, and, and benefiting from decolonization and the resurgence of, of indigenous life ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that, so positionality, you know, it's such a, it's such a tricky, but critical, yes. critical thing, you know, and I, I think I've had, I've had one or two lessons around it myself, I think, where I've put my feet, I've like, you know, trodden in a place I shouldn't. And I'm always like so carefully. Now one of the things I always try to remember in, you know, when I'm trying to do some work or activism is that is reciprocity. You're always trying to keep keeping things in balance. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and and meeting those different obligations or responsibilities, but that but keeping things those relationships in in balance. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm sort of going off the going off into a slightly different tack, but it's been really it's been very heavy duty in class the last two or three weeks, and so finding ways to to work with positionality mm -hmm. and and to develop the relationships between the, the Indigenous students but those who are not Indigenous to place yeah. um, is really critical. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, mm. The other thing that we wanted to make sure we had time for was to talk about the places that hold meaning for our hearts and also the practices of how we nurture mm. wairua. So bringing it down to whakatina and how do we practice these, these um, the nurturing of wairua? Hmm. You know, the the places where our hearts find meaning was a theme that we talked about. Um, and I, I that little phrase does, again, comes from another brilliant person, not me, um, that comes from Albert Went and his amazing groundbreaking essay called um, Towards a New Oceania. And there's a small line in there where he talks about our um, search for that heaven or that Hawaii, he says, or that place where our hearts find meaning. We're always kind of in search of that place. Um, and I do a lot of work or a lot of my research is focused on kahiki. And that's where Hawaiians say we came from before arriving in Hawaii. It's not a place on a map. Um, it's the knowing of connection. It's the ancestral memory of people and places in other parts of the Pacific that we are connected to. Um, and kahiki is, for me, where my heart finds meaning um, and purpose. Waimea trains me 
to do that work, to find it, to continually search for it. Um, Kahiki is a spiritual, ideological space that I return to constantly um, to find inspiration, to act upon my connections to the region, um, which includes the place that I'm currently living, but it's also the place I go to when I need to put myself in check. Um, Kahiki is kind of like a sanctuary for me. And I mean sanctuary in the sense that it's this beautiful place where I find relief, but it's also in the Hawaiian sense, we used to have pu'uhonua, where if a pu'uhonua was a sanctuary, sanctuary, if you broke a law, you better get to the pu'uhonua for safety. But while you're there, you need to do the work to be able to then reintegrate back into society. So you don't live in a pu'uhonua, but you go there to do the work. So Kahiki is that place for me. It's this deeply spiritual place that I continually go to that motivates what I do. Um, it helps me to act upon my connections to the Pacific, but not lean too comfortably on them. So while I live here, it's very easy for me to say, I'm indigenous to the region, but that does not allow me to stake any kind of claim to the Fenua that I'm on. Instead, it's I'm indigenous to the region, I'm connected to you, how can I help? What can I do? Um, and I've made mistakes. And so I have to go back to Kahiki sometimes and think, how did you, well, how did you handle this incorrectly, Emileni? What can you learn from it so you don't do it again? Um, so Kahiki is a place of deep critical reflection, but also a deep a place of really, really honoring and, and nurturing my relationship, not just to my literal home in Hawaii, but to my wider Pacific home. Um, and for me to get into nourishing Wairua, I go back to the concept I brought up in the beginning of Aloha Aina. Aloha is love and it is an action that is fierce. Yes, it's beautiful. Yes, we all want to experience love. But when aloha is put with aina, with place, it's fierce because it has to be. But it's also deeply intimate. And so I try to, as I mentioned earlier, learn the stories of place, learn who I am in place, be fed from place. And that's, that's what nurturing wairua is for me. I recognize that I am aina, that aina is me, and there is absolutely no disconnection. I am the ground that I'm walking on generations back, generations forward. And I feel like if we all lived in that way all the time, which is hard to always be in that kind of frame of mind, gosh, we'd be in such a better place. Our planet would be in a better place. Um, but Kahiki is what takes me from just acting for home to acting better and doing better for my wider home and all of the places that I am I am connected to in memory, in aloha, in genealogy um, across the region. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. I'm just... Uh... Lois, I know you have some practices for nurturing wairua rattling around in that big heart and big brain. Yeah, I, I mean, it's many things for me. I, I've because I've been in so many places and it's been circumstantial. Um, I think everyone has their, has their own path. And so for me, it's, um, it's that deep sense of water or that deep sense of place. It, it is knowing that I'm part of that greater whakapapa, right? Sometimes it might be going back to Maua I'm back on my own, I'm back on my own in Tauranga Moana. I'm getting in my, in my here, in, in here, yeah. But it also, you know, for me, it's regular practices. It's regular practices like, um, you know, as someone who um, came into Vipassana, Theravada meditation, before I really came more deeply into my Ngātarangitanga, you know, there is that daily practice of uh, both cultivating um, the equanimity and also also the, the compassion. And I find that um, aroha, you know, I don't necessarily wake up every day feeling aroha. I, it, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, as I was saying the other day, sometimes I feel irritable, I, you know, so I, so it's starting each day for me intentionally, you know, and sitting, sitting quiet and instilling my, my being, connecting to Papa Tuanuku, right, um, connecting to myself, but uh, cultivating, cultivating 
that the um, both the both the the loving loving Araha, also you talked about the the face, yeah, but also that that um, that that integrity of being, you know, and no one can actually take your mana from you. And I believe for me, mana mana comes from my actions. And so starting off with that foundation and that intention each day. And because I have been in so many places, um, finding places where I can do some ceremony, finding places, that's incredibly, you know, and I develop places I go to where I can I can be in, in ceremony. Um, you know, I'm sometimes I'm not very good at, I don't call upon my tupuna as much as I should, you know. So, so calling upon all the fuck papa that I'm that I'm part of is really really important. The simple the simple thing in terms of cultivating reciprocity, um, doing my ongo practice, and 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 learning who the plant beings are, learning who the the you know the the water beings are, um, spending time being still. Um, so these are these are the things, and it, it's very easy in a busy kind of you know, in, in academia can be such a head space. And every we so need spirituality and wider in academia and every opportunity. You know, sometimes if I start my classes always with a karakia that I've made my own, and you know, and and even though sometimes there are times I can feel a little bit silly doing it. In, in this kind of university place. And there's no protocol for where I am at all. We can't even do like a smudge inside. We do our smudge, the students do the smudges outside. But, but, that, but I see it going into the students. I see the students going, oh yes, it's okay to do this. So just even those practices, um, you know, and sometimes just going, just going, getting myself to go against the grain, to swim that upstream. Um, but so all those little acts, all those little acts are nurturing water, water to me, yeah. We've had some really beautiful questions within the, the chat and aroha mai, we won't have time for all of these, but there, there is a bit of a theme in there around this connection. And, and I wondered whether or not, we, you know, we've heard you talk about your relationship to land and yourselves um, amid varying degrees of disconnection. Do you have any any advice? <laughs> do you have any fakaros? Do you have any thoughts for people who might be struggling to find that connection, be they Indigenous or be they um, Pākehā and are finding it a bit difficult to be able to find that connection? Anything that you might offer to people who who are struggling with that because a lot of our people do, yeah? Mm. 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 Uh, I would actually... Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I, well, two, well, two things. I would actually say whatever land you're in, so if you're in, if you're in home, at my home, Aotearoa, I would say go and do a Rongo Māori course mm. because that will connect you to the Nahiri, that will connect in a very practical, tangible way. The other thing I would say is that um, is to remind people, right, that they're, if they're not indigenous to place, that their ancestors were indigenous to place, that that this 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 ability to connect to be of place, I think that Papa Tuanuku is all is loving to all her children, right, and even when we are not in place. We can be in place. Try and develop your peripheral vision because society teaches us to be linear, but anything that comes to you from your peripheral vision will lead you back to back to place. Mm -hmm. That's what I would, yeah. The dream life, the, 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 the impressions that you pick up that you yeah. think are gobbledygook. <laughs> anyway, over to you, Emilani. <laughs> No, I was just going to say to take it back to some of the themes of our kōrero today. Um, start with where you are. Start with what's beneath yeah. you and get back, uh, get beyond what you mentioned earlier, Louis, the colonial scheme. 
There, you, there's a the well, Wellington city transforms when you know what's under it. And you stop seeing the city as this normalized space and you read beyond the street signs of Wakefield and Oriental and Cuba and Tory and you read beyond the colonial narrative when you start yeah. to open the names of the place. So if you are disconnected from where you come from, maybe you don't know where you come from, start with where you are. Because I truly believe that growing and cultivating a relationship with where you are, which may come from learning the stories, learning some of the names, because gosh, yeah. every name holds a story and sometimes holds a lesson and sometimes holds an instruction. Start to cultivate a love of place. Learn to love it. Talk to it. Talk to it. I walk yeah. in the I head and I talk. <laughs> I touch them. I want to feel their energy. And if you're disconnected, but you know where you come from, continue to talk to your Aina, to your Fenua at home. I talk to my mountain all the time. Just before I came on, my mom said, think like the Mauna, think of the Mauna, think of your mountain and you'll be grounded. And I do, I do that every single day. So you can continue to cultivate relationships, no matter the physical distance. Physical distance is just, is, never separates us actually. So cultivate the relationship, but if you don't, if you're not practiced in it and you don't know it, just start by looking right down beneath you and know that if it's concrete, that there's something under that. Is it? <laughs> Find it. Find it. Learn it. Love it. Yeah. Find it. Learn it. Love it. Nice <laughs> beneath our feet. You too. Honestly, what an absolute yeah. joy and a gift it has been to listen to you. One hour is never enough. But it's a bit of a something and I think we all I've been trying to rapidly take notes it feels like everything you both say, say is a quotable quote and and I know that our our team at the um who are running the Hui will be doing the same as well I just want to thank you both because what I do know to be true is that the knowledge and articulation the wisdom the ahu the wairua that you both hold is what is so needed for our world right now it is so needed and what I also know to be true is that when you talk about your your politics and your activism it is an embodied journey that comes from deeply knowing the ground beneath your feet being willing to transform in yourselves being willing to face the pain as well as the healing as well as the power and so thank you both for walking in your own manner and walking your own journey so that we may get to hear snippets of gems of wisdom um, today that will see us on our own journeys as well so thank you both for your generosity and what you have shared and in our final 30 seconds, I'm just going to do a karakia to send us on our way, to clear what has been said, to unite us and bind us. And thank you, um, Stephen and Jacinta, for holding space and making everything work in the background. Thank you for the team at Te Tiriti Based Futures who made this happen. And thank you all for participating. Um, hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. So a karakia to send us on our way. Unuhia, unuhia. Unuhia ki te urutapu nui kia wātia, kia māma, te nākau, te tinana, te wairua i te aratakata, koe a rā e rongo, whake iri aki ki runga, tuturu, whakamawa kia tīna, tīna, haumi e, hui e, tai ki e. Kaki te kia koutou, go well, be safe. Find it, learn it, love it.